Third, welcome. Thank you, Melva, and uh, well, thank you, fellow alumni and all the other guests we have in the room tonight. Thanks very much for, for coming along. Um, so for the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I'm just going to give you a rundown for this new ARC Centre of Excellence. Um, as Melva's always already uh, explained, it's called the, uh, up here in the top corner, the ARC, that's the Australian Research Council, Centre of Excellence for Australian Biodiversity and Heritage. And it's really about our story, our story as Australians living here in Australia. Because if we don't do it as Australians, no one else is going to do it for us. We actually have to do the investigating ourselves and we have a vested interest in obviously doing it. Um, it's not just about human history, of course, that's a very interesting part of what is Australia, but also about our natural history. And I'll get through to all of these things uh, in the next half hour or so. So this is what I'm going to cover. I'll start off with some of the kind of structure of what we're actually doing in the centre. What was our motivation and what is our seven-year mission? So we've been funded from the middle of this year through until about the middle of 2023, which seems like a, a long way away, but as you'll see, we've got a lot to get on with, so we can't afford to be too slack in the meantime. Um, I'll talk a bit about the themes uh, and the teams that we've assembled to, uh, to, to, to look at all the uh, biodiversity and heritage questions, what those questions actually are and how we're going to handle those, because there are many questions you can ask, and there's only so many we can actually feasibly answer. Uh, and I'm also going to point out all the way through what we call transdisciplinary and culturally inclusive culture or an approach, which is the transdisciplinary one, is we've got a, a huge range of disciplines coming to bear, from the sciences through to the humanities and the arts and indigenous knowledge systems. All of these are part of what is going to be CARBA, and it has to be, because Australia's story isn't just about what happened in the past in a very dry, dry and dull way, which can sometimes come out of a scientific inquiry. It's got to be livened up so that everyone in Australia can actually engage with why it matters. Um, so that's really why we're making it as transdisciplinary as you possibly can be. And the culturally inclusive part to bring on people from the, the, the sciences, the humanities, so traditionally very split areas, and indigenous knowledge systems. And having done some great science and research, we also want to get it out there into the sort of general place, so the general public and students can all get excited by it, and in particular students because, well, people of my age who are over the hill already, um, we really want to persuade young Australians this is something they should care about. It's only people actually care about the country that are going to do anything about looking after the country going forward. So a lot of our efforts are going to go into school-age kids um, all the way through to members of the general public, but in particular younger age groups, because I think that's really a target which we can make good headroads on. And if you're interested in what we're doing, we're always happy to do stuff with everyone who's interested. So there'll be collaborative opportunities, and I'll mention those towards the end as well and on the way through. And I've left some brochures out there, I think they were, on the, on the table on the way outside. So grab one. Uh, they're leftovers from our launch, but it sort of gives you an idea of what we're doing. Uh, and also got my, my business card and also that of my Chief Operating Officer, Julie Matazic. So please contact us if you think you know, you'd like to get involved in some fashion and uh, we'll, get in, we'll get back in touch with you. Okay, let's get started on the structural stuff. This will go for about maybe 10 minutes or so. And it seems a bit dull, but you need to know why we're doing what we're doing. Then I'll get on to what we're actually going to do. Um, the most important thing is we're going to transform our understanding of what we know about Australia's human and natural history. And you might think, don't we know that already? Um, the short answer is no, we actually know incredibly little. What we do know is very patchy in both kind of space and time. The little bits of knowledge we've got in some areas, and it only covers very narrow time slots going back into the past. From that, we weave together lovely stories, but actually you could tell a completely different story on exactly the same data set at the moment because we have so little data from which to build a story. So we've actually got to go out there and gather some actual data to actually make a story that's actually something that did happen in the past. I mean, something did happen in the past in Australia. It's our job to find out what. Importantly, we want to unite the sciences with the humanities and the indigenous knowledge for all sorts of reasons, because we want to get the story out there so that the whole population of Australia can actually understand it, not just scientists. Scientists can often be very introspective and think we're doing a fabulous job, everyone understands what we're doing and why we're doing it, why it's so important, and then you get out there and everyone says, who cares? And you think, oh, I didn't think you thought that way, because it seems so obvious when you're doing the science why it should matter. But you've actually got to translate that, and getting the translation is actually a big job, and you need to get people from the other side of the of the park to come to you and say, okay, what is it you're not getting about what we're doing and why it matters? So the social sciences do matter, as do the arts. A lot of people relate to things through the arts, so we have a big arts program going as well. 
And of course, indigenous knowledge, because the human history of this country is really an indigenous culture. It's an indigenous history. Europeans arrived late on in the scene. We've had 65,000 years of people in this country before Europeans finally rocked up. So it's basically an indigenous history that we're trying to delve into. And of course, we don't just want to tell Australians about what a fabulous history we've got, because the rest of the world's interested too. They look at us and they think, yeah, we've got koalas, we've got kangaroos, we've got platypuses, we've got these crazy animals. Um, but actually, we've got one of the longest lasting indigenous cultures outside of Africa. Australia was one of the first settled continents when our ancestors left Africa. That's a very important story to tell the world, and, and, the, and the world wants to hear that story. So whenever we've gone out and talked to overseas museums, they've been fascinated by the fact, oh yeah, we'd love to do something with you guys, what are you going to do? And we said, well, we don't have to do things immediately because we've got seven years to roll out something, so bring it on board, because museums have got a huge lead time. If you're talking to the Smithsonian, they don't do anything next year, they've already planned what next year is 10 years ago. So you've got to get in very early to get the lead time up with these really big institutions. We've got a huge turning around circle to get them on board. But they're all on board because Australia is a very important place. And of course, we're one of only seven continents on Earth. So we do hold a special place on Earth. And just importantly, we actually want to use these lessons from the past to actually help shape a sustainable future for this continent. Because history doesn't actually, it's not something back there. Actually, history is going forward all the time. Everything that led up to where we are now is still carrying on. All the legacies, the letters, all the trajectories that brought us to this point in time, sitting in this room, are going to be with us tomorrow as well, and the day after, and the day after that. It hasn't stopped. And on top of that, whatever we're doing to the world now, that's getting superimposed, dumped on top of all those historical legacies. But the first thing we've got to do is work out what all the past trajectories were that have brought us to this point in time, so we can actually work out where we might be heading, given all the other things that we're doing now to the planet. So we do want to use the past to help inform the present and the future. So this is who we are. I'll get, I'll get around to what this actual map is in, at the end of this um, little uh, slide. But we've got universities. We, we're headquartered down here at Wollongong, of course. Uh, we've got James Cook University up here in Cairns, in Townsville. We've got people there who are into indigenous education, geochemistry and archaeology. We've got University of New South Wales. They're into climate science, science communication, paleoanthropology. Uh, down here at Wollongong, there's myself. I'm actually kind of a geochronologist, geomorphologist, archaeological scientist. I've kind of done a lot of things over the last little while. Um, we've got people who are specialists in museum studies. That's Amanda Lawson, our deputy director, based over in the Law, Humanities and Arts faculty. Uh, we've got people who are geochronologists, two other chief investigators here, geomorphologists based here at Wollongong. Uh, down here at ANU in Canberra, this is the Australian National University, we've got archaeologists and paleoecologists. Paleoecologists are people who look at the ecology of the world in the past. The paleo bit on the front just means it's something that happened in the past. Down here at Monash University in Melbourne, we have archaeologists, again, indigenous studies, that's an indigenous studies centre we're tying in with there. Tasmania, we have ecologists, wildlife ecologists, we have um, ecological modellers, because the modelling part, as I'll sort of point out in the moment, is actually very important if you're trying to work out what's going to happen in the future. That's essentially a modelling exercise based on what we know now. Whatever that was. Um, and over here in Adelaide, we have two universities, the University of Adelaide and Flinders University, and they're bringing on board geneticists, wildlife ecologists, paleontologists. Um, we actually have a huge range of, array of people with different disciplinary backgrounds from around, particularly the eastern seaboard, but we're also working with people in other places. This is just the universities that we're working with. There are eight of us, and we're also working with other partner organisations within Australia, particularly outreach partners, Australia Museum, Queensland Museum, State Library in New South Wales, and the South Australia Museum, because these really have a much bigger public footprint than we do. Universities are not particularly good at public outreach. We're doing some of it here. Um, but the universities, uh, the museums have scores of people coming in all the time and of the sorts of age groups we really want to attract. So the museums are kind of key partners uh, in our centre, as well as various other ones like Scarp Archaeology, which is a local um, archaeological consultancy, because we're tying in, they've got good connections in certain parts of the country, and Bioplatforms Australia, which is a federally funded infrastructure facility that allows you to do big genomics types of works. So let me just get on to what this map actually shows. It's actually um, all the different indigenous language, social or nation groups in Australia. And that was put together by the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. And really what I wanted to show is how incredibly diverse it is. One tends to think, ah, what do indigenous people think? Well, indigenous people, guess what? They're just like Western people. There are many of them, and they do not all hold the same view because they... <coughs> Indigenous people come from many different nation groups around the country. They have different uh, 
views of what should be done on their land, what can be done, how we can work with them. And we have to work with all of these different groups when we're going to different places, because these are our collaborators. The indigenous people are our partners in all of the endeavors we're doing here on the human and natural history. So it's quite a lot of work to just politically get this all streamlined so we don't waste our time just getting it politically sorted out and we do nothing at all, but we can actually work with our indigenous collaborators on country to do what they want us to do and what it is we'd like to do as well. So this is really, it is a partnership. It's not just us going onto their land and taking off it whatever we need for our purposes. And of course we've got some international partners too. Possibly our most important are these ones down here actually, in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. That's uh, the National Research Centre for Archaeology in Jakarta, uh, University of Papua New Guinea and the Papua New Guinea Museum and Art Gallery. And the reason they're so important, as you'll see in a moment, is basically Australia was joined to Papua New Guinea and Indonesia for most of the last 130, 140,000 years. They've been joined to them for most of the last two and a half million years. Um, so they're really part of Australia, or they might view it as part of them. They might see it as we're part of greater Papua New Guinea. Um, and up here, we've got partners who can bring particular specialties to us that we don't have here in Australia. Uh, genetics here at the Max Planck Institute in Jena, uh, genetics here at Harvard University in the US, uh, we've got some geoscience facilities, geochronology and geomorphology here at University of Copenhagen, the University of Savoy in France, University of Col Colorado in Boulder, and the National Centre for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. So they all bring particular specialties that we don't really have here in the way we want them to do the kind of work we want to do over the next seven years. And we've got a few other places, the Smithsonian, uh, the Natural History Museum in London, and the National Natural History Museum in Copenhagen. They're all big outreach partners in the Northern Hemisphere. Now these are just people we have now. We're going to get more people on board as we keep traveling along for the next seven years, but this is enough to get us started. And particularly some of those big ones like the Smithsonian and both of these two natural history museums, they require long lead times, like I say, to get exhibitions up and running on something to do with Australia, which we will do in the later years so that we can incorporate some of the findings we're actually making over the first few years. So here it is. Here's who we actually are. We've got 27 collaborating organizations all up. 18 chief investigators, those are the people based at the universities. 15 Australian and international partners in various places around Australia and the world. And 11 other participants, either as individuals or as organisations. And that number's growing. And you might be amongst that growing number. So we have people joining up to do specific things that we can't currently do. We have, for example, historians joining us to do certain things in this space. So if you've got a particular specialty and you think, I can actually bring something to this centre. We're happy to talk to you. Happy to, happy to work with whoever can do add value to Carver. Who have we got so far? Well, a bunch of researchers and educators in natural sciences particularly, obviously earth and climate sciences, that's my background, ecology and genetics, and the humanities and the arts, archaeology, museology, and indigenous studies. So very broad. I think out of all the Australian Research Council centres of excellence, we are the broadest in terms of our disciplinary base because most of them are very niche. They do this, they might save lives or they're going to make a widget and they're going to do it exceptionally well and they're going to make money for the country and we thank them for that. Or they're going to save Australian lives and we thank them for that. Pretty much everyone we're working with is already dead. So, um, you know, we're working in the past. So we're not going to be saving any lives um, and we're not going to be making any money directly, although you know, there are indirect ways in which obviously we contribute to the Australian economy. So how are we going to actually work it? Well, we've got to bundle it up into manageable portions. So we have various themes. Humans, obviously, because that's the archaeology component of it. Climate, landscapes, wildlife. Time, because time runs throughout. That's the constant thread going through history. So we need to get things in the right order so we know what happened when. Once we know what happened when, we can start to work out cause and effect. But if you don't know when they happened, we're not going to be able to work out that simple equation. And the glue in the middle is models. Um, and I say it's a glue in the middle because all of these other things are excellent at doing their thing, but now we need to bring it together and really fuse them together and integrate them together in order to make something more coherent. Both for making future predictions about what might happen means we've got to bring together all this past information, say, can we actually retrodictively say, yep, we're getting the right answer, we can predict what happened in the past based on these data sets using a good model. Because um, if we can't retrodict what happened in the past, then obviously we're not going to have much of a possibility of getting good prediction going forward. You've got to at least get things right that did happen before you can project, project what might happen in the future. And also you want to use the models even for the past because no matter how much we do in the next seven years, there's still going to be large gaps on the map. Large gaps spatially, geographically, and large gaps through time. So we're going to have to model the bits that are missing in some way. Now they're 
perfectly good ways in which you can do that. But the models are important both for putting together a good past story and for modeling what might be happening into the future. I've already mentioned how important it is to do the transdisciplinary research. It's also a transdisciplinary research training program because our belief is that most researchers these days get to be very good at very little until you're exceptionally brilliant at almost nothing. Um, it's very, very reductionist. Um, and certainly you get to be exceptional at one thing, but you've really got to be able to understand the language of some other branch of science or someone in the social sciences. You've got to get outside the bubble to be able to really understand what you're doing and why it might matter to someone else apart from you and your nearest and dearest. So it's actually getting that transdisciplinary mindset all the way through our researchers. So we're going to plonk them in other places for months at a time and say, talk to these people and really understand what it is they're doing. You don't just say to a geneticist, well, I guess you're the expert. I'll take your word for it. That's not good enough. You need to really know what those people are talking about and why they're doing it that way and not some other way. So it's really getting across that idea that if you're going to be a transdisciplinary researcher, you need to get out of your own little nest and park yourself like a cuckoo in someone else's nest for a while to work out what's actually going on in their headspace. Then you're going to have someone who can go out into the, into the modern workplace and do something useful because they can switch around as needs be. Because Australia's future workforce requirements are going to change over time depending on the way the world goes. We don't know which way it's going to go. So rather than try and pick winners, just say, get yourself across all of it as much as you possibly can so you can adapt yourself to the new circumstances you find yourself in. And it doesn't just mean within STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, maths. It means across into the social sciences as well. Get yourself out there and try and work out what people are doing out there in the social science space. I've never done any social science stuff in my life. And I realized, as I started pulling this together, how completely inappropriately equipped I was to actually navigate that area. So thankfully, I've got a lot of people around me who could help me talk that language. And I'm sort of kind of learning on the fly. Um, but we want to make sure that the next generation down have actually got that skill set when they actually leave as PhDs. They graduate with a PhD and they can do a whole bunch of other stuff that are current PhDs. And that's for every university in the country. People specialise to such a narrow extent that they really they, they get locked into one area only. We need to broaden that out. So that's a, that's a key thing for us, the research training. Okay, so that's the, sort of the background for what we're doing. So what are we going to do? Let's start off with this map here on the left. Here's Australia as it was 65,000 years ago. There's a sort of squelchy marshland and a bit of dry land. You can walk all the way to Papua New Guinea and Port Moresby if you want to, or over here onto the bird's head of uh, Indonesia. We were joined by dry land basically all the way to Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. And we've been that way for pretty much all of the last 100 odd thousand years, apart from now and about 130,000 years ago. So what I've got on this little right going graph here is, here's 140,000 years ago going right up to the present over here. And this is really a, a kind of a proxy sea level curve. It was very high about 140,000 years ago. Then it went down and down and down and down and down and down. It was at its lowest about 20,000 years ago. Whoop, and then it rose up very steeply. And this is pretty much where we are now. So for most of the last 140,000 years, sea level has been quite a bit lower than it is now. And it's also uh, a climate curve. This is actually an oxygen isotope curve from an Antarctic ice core. But it's a, a, a global proxy for how warm and cold the world has been in the past. Um, it was warmer here and colder here. So as you can see, the sea level now is pretty high and it's pretty warm. We're what we call in an interglacial. We're between glacials. The rest of it is called a glacial. So this is a glacial period in here. And the height of the glacial was here. At that point, Antarctica was much bigger than it is now, and the northern hemisphere and covered in ice in various places, massively expanded ice sheets. But of course, we didn't have ice sheets down here in Australia, hardly any. So what happened down here? during the last ice age. We, all these questions come out of what's happened in the past. So the world's, of course, not as we see it now. The world as we see it now, in fact, has been a rather an exceptional situation. The world has mostly been not as we see it now. And one of the reasons is people arrived, we think, about here, maybe 65,000 years ago in Australia. What happened then? So the way we've broken it down is to say, hmm, we've got this big land mass here. In fact, us joined up to PNG and Indonesia is called Sahul. And on the other side, over here, on the Asian side, is something called Sunda. And that's because at the same time as the sea level dropped down and we got joined to Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, Sumatra, Java, Borneo, all the way to Bali, got joined to mainland Asia. So you could walk all the way to Bali. You didn't have to fly to Denpasar. You could just walk all the way there. And that's how tigers get to Bali. They just walk to Bali. Um, and that's why you don't get tigers on the other side of what they call Wallace's Line. This is Wallace's Line, named after Alfred Russell Wallace who of course was a contemporary of Charles Darwin. They both came up, they're sort of co-inventors of the uh, 
natural selection theory of evolution. Um, and this is Wallace's line because he was a great biogeographer and he noticed that the fauna on this side of the line were completely different from the fauna on this side of the line. Uh, and that's called Wallace's line. And if you can cross over Wallace's line, it's utterly different. Once you're over here, you can actually island hop all the way to Australia. This is called Lydecker's line. And this bit in the middle is called Wallacea after Alfred Russell Wallace. And for Kaaba, we're interested in both Sahul and Wallacea. Because if you can cross over Wallace's line, you're home free all the way down to here into Sahul. You can, get to, you can get to Australia. If you can make one ocean crossing, you can make another three or four ocean crossings. The question is, can you make an ocean crossing? Tigers can't, so I guess they just drown here and they get washed out into the Indian Ocean. So there are probably a whole bunch of tiger carcasses down here somewhere, um, as they all tried. I mean, tigers can swim, but they clearly can't swim against the tide. So they're, they're dead down here somewhere. But a few, a few mammals can get across, including humans. Bats can get across. Not many. Elephants can get across. So there have been lots of elephants that have got across here. They're called stegodon in this part of the world. And, and they went extinct sometime too. So this is a very interesting part of the world, and some wacky things have been found here, and I'll talk about some of those in a moment. And then at the end of the line, as it were, down here, is us, Australia. We are very much it. That's it. There wasn't any contact between us and New Zealand. That's why they've been left off here. So they only got, New Zealand only got visited much, much later, maybe 800 years ago, by Polynesians, basically, coming around the corner. Um, so they swept around here and bumped into New Zealand. So that's the way the world was 65,000 years ago. But here are our questions. We have, we have it broken down into five. What was Australia like before people? That's this big block of time here. Well, half of this is Australia before people, but it went through a big change. It went from an interglacial all the way down into this glacial. So a lot was happening in Australia, even over that first 65,000 years. But what was happening? We know almost nothing about that at the present stage. Something happens. I mean, basically, when modern humans arrive on any place on the planet, bad things happen shortly afterwards. That seems to be the sort of general take-home message. The question is, how bad was it and what happened? Um, we don't really know at the moment. After that, of course, are all the impacts and aftershocks. Um, for example, we know that Australia used to have much bigger marsupials. We had giant marsupials, we had giant reptiles, we had giant birds. Like, the whole fauna of Australia looked nothing like it does now. Um, but why was that? Why did they go extinct? When did they go extinct? And what are the repercussions of that? These were like major browsers. Australia's vegetation was completely different back then because the browsers kept all the browse down. When you take off all the browsers, that's why some people think the fire has increased over time. Suddenly you get more browse, it starts to burn, it starts to change the vegetation transformation. So things are happening in this period of time as a consequence of people arriving and changing things around them. Number four is what happened during the Ice Age? How did people actually survive in the Ice Age? In some places, the water sources would certainly have shrunk. What happened when they did? Where did people go to? How did they survive? How did they interact? You start putting different human groups together along a narrow water course. There's going to be something happen. Um, what happened? We don't know at the moment. And coming out of it, in the post-glacial period, we know there was a big population explosion in Aboriginal populations. But when did that happen? And what were the consequences of that enormous increase in human population? When Europeans arrived, Current best estimates are about a, a, a million Aboriginal people on this continent. Um, but for most of human history on this continent, much, much lower than that. Maybe only a few tens of thousands of people. OK, let's get on to some of these origins and transformations. Well, which route do people take through Indonesia? And I'll get on to that in a moment. There are two ways. You can scut along Java, all the way Flores, cross Wallace's line, through Timor, and maybe pop into northern Australia via the Kimberley or Arnhem Land. That's one route, the southern route. Or you can go via the northern route. So the southern route would take you down through here and then pop in the north there. The northern route, you could possibly come up here through Sulawesi, go through here, and then maybe through Papua New Guinea. So there's kind of a northern route and there's a southern route. We don't know which, we don't know which route people took, but people have done some modeling, and I'll show you a bit of that in a moment to give you an idea. When did people first arrive in Australia? Well, that's still a moot point. Um, as I mentioned a moment, I've been working on that problem myself for the last, well, since I did my PhD here at Wollongong. Um, so current best estimates are about 65,000 years ago. And that's at this site here called Majabibi. Here's the actual excavation. It goes down maybe oh, about as deep as this uh, wall. Uh, and we're working closely with people in, uh, from Mirar country. There's a Mirar people. It's their country. They tell us what we're allowed to do on the site. So they're dictating the terms. So we have a memorandum of understanding, and it's completely on their terms. They say, this is what we'd like you to do. We do. We say, this is what we'd like to do. Are you happy with that? Yep. So it's a complete collaborative agreement. 
because archaeology has had a bit of a checkered history in the past about how well it's got on with Aboriginal people and done a very bad job at it. That's all changed in the last 20 years, and we're trying to sort of set new standards, new benchmarks for how it should be done, how you should be engaging with Indigenous people on country to actually do what it is they want us to do and not what it is just we want to do. Um, and what happened afterwards? What happened when people got in? I already mentioned that the megafauna went extinct, the vegetation probably changed. We need to flesh out all of that. And why should we care? Because all of those changes in the past are still living with us today. They haven't stopped happening. So we have to actually work out what did happen in the past and what the consequences of that were. And if they matter going forward, simply ignoring it and hope it doesn't matter is not really a very good starting point. And looking at the last 200 years of instrumental or historical record doesn't give you much of a backdrop as to what's going to happen over the next 20, 50, or 100 years. There's just not enough time frame. You're looking for long-term trajectories, so you've got to get back at least a few thousand years into the past. And one of our other chief investigators, based here at the University of Wollongong, Zenobia Jacobs, she's actually redated this site to 65,000 years ago. I'll talk about this plot in, on the right in a moment. This is actually me. In 1989, when I was doing my PhD, at that very site, look, I've even got a natty beard. Um, how pathetic was that? I'm glad to say it's all gone now. You won't see that again anytime soon. Um, and I was just at the very end of my doing my PhD, and uh, I was actually just doing the landscape history of Arnhem Land, la landscape history of Kakadu. And I bumped into an archaeologist, uh, Rhys Jones, uh, who's since passed away, sadly, and uh, we got going on this site called uh, Majabibi. Uh, we didn't mean to be digging here actually in the first place. We were actually supposed to be digging at another site. We got turned away from that site. So we ended up going here. And we struck lucky straight away um, because it turned out to be exceptionally old. These green little numbers here, this is actually a time scale going from 120,000 years ago to the present day. And this is the very lowest bunch of artifacts. The whole sequence goes up for several meters. So I've just shown you just a very few dates. And these are the ones from the very oldest artifacts. We've done lots and lots of samples. Zenobia did all of these ones. She did all the ones in grey. We had another laboratory do a couple of other samples. They're the ones in blue. And these are the ones in green that I did all those years ago, back in 1989. Um, we published a paper on that in 1990. Turned out I was about right then, but no one believed me. Well, a few people believed me. A lot of people told me, you're wrong. And they've been telling me that for the last 27 years. But it turned out I wasn't that far wrong after all. Um, but of course, sometimes I am wrong, so you know, I'm not always right, and I have to accept that. Uh, and when we did this study, uh, Zenobia was doing it, we were even much better at techniques than I was using back then, you know, 27 years ago. And I said, look, just go for your life. If I'm right, wouldn't that be wonderful? And if I'm wrong, well, too bad. I'll just have to, you know, eat some humble pie and just say, there you go, you're right all along. I was wrong. Um, but it turned out it was about 65,000 years, and it's much the oldest site in the country. If we just flick back to the previous slide, these are the only other sites of anything like comparable age. Another one up here called Nawala Gabamang, another one called Naolabla, Carpenter's Gap, Booty Cave, Riwi, Devil's Lair, Lake Mungo, and one called Rachi Rock Shelter. Those are about the only sites, archaeological sites in Australia, that are older than about 47, 48,000. So we have a few of them, half a dozen, between about 50 and 60, and then Majabibi out here, the very top end of Australia, is about 65,000 years. Hmm. Now, is that just a fluke, or are there other ones that age? Obviously, we're going to be doing more digging up there to find out what the answer is. But that's one reason why the Northern Australia is like a key area. We know almost nothing about Northern Australia. We have no megafauna remains, none of those giant animals from anywhere north of about here. The top half of Australia is virtually devoid of bones of megafauna. So we can make any story we like about that in the absence of evidence. But it wouldn't be great to actually get some remains. Probably we'll have to go up here into Papua New Guinea, somewhere where it's likely to be preserved. And the sorts of things we find in these very lowest levels are about 65, 60,000 years old. Possibly, you know, the very last ones in this phase uh, are somewhere around about a few 50,000s of years old. You get these grinding stones. These are used to grind plant material. So actually, when people came to Australia, beneath these lowest artifacts are a bunch of sterile sediments. Sterile meaning they don't have any artifacts. They don't have any archaeological remains in them. So we know that when people came, they came bang. And they came with everything. They came with the whole kit and caboodle. All the stone tools, all the kinds of things we find in later sites and in other early sites in, in Europe and Euro in, in Asia, we find here in Australia from 65,000 years ago. So it wasn't as if things have progressed over time. They came in, bang, with everything we consider to be fully modern human behavior. So the first Australians came in from Indonesia, and they knew exactly what they were doing. And so they landed on this country, and they probably thought, wow, a whole empty place. Where do we go to now? Um, and that's the question, where do we go to now? Well, how did they get there in the first place? We'll get on to where they go to next once they've got here. How did they get there in the first place? Let's go from the oceans to the outback. Here we've got 
Southeast Asia. There's Borneo, there's Java. Here's Wallace's line, stippled up in white. And so it's Sulawesi, Papua New Guinea, and Northern Australia. And here's Majibibi, just over here. Um, the blue, this is the sea level 65,000 years ago. The dark blue is ones where you can see the next bit of land. You don't actually have to leave the coast. You think, oh, I can see some land over there. So you can just set sail and you'll get to that bit of land. The visibility is perfect. The bit in light blue means you've got to set sail and you can see the next bit of land and you can just see where you've left as well. So you don't have to be too adventurous. It's not really open ocean. You can still see where you've just left and if you you know, lose, you know, chicken out, you can go back to where you've just come from or you can carry on to the next place. Um, but the important thing is you can, you can make it all the way to Papua New Guinea just by seeing land all the way there. You can island hop all the way there. Because remember, sea level is lower, so there are actually more islands exposed then than there are now. And you can island hop all the way to Australia, basically, without actually having to ever leave sight of land. You can even do it via this route. You might have to drift a little bit off Timor, but you can actually show that you can drift. The currents through here are quite strong. If you just set off on a little raft, you'd actually drift and you bump into the Kimberley quite quickly after a few days on, on a decent current at certain times of the year. So to get into Australia is actually not as difficult as you might think it's going to be. You've just got to get on a raft and get cracking, um, or get paddling. Actually, one of the things I had to do for a, a ridiculous Discovery um, Channel thing was um, trying to raft between a couple of these islands here. I get incredibly seasick really fast. So I, I was only an hour out and ooh. So I definitely took the northern route, or my ancestors would have taken the northern route. An easy walk. A limited amount of ocean travel for my ancestors. Someone more adventurous can go this route. But there are lots of routes. Can you, do you go this way or do you go this way? Um, we don't know. You can model it and you can come up with good plausible reasons as to you could go either way. One thing we want to do is obviously go to these islands and find out which ones were settled first by people. Then we can work out which line it is that they probably went along. At the moment, any line is equally plausible. I put a couple of our little triangles on here. There's one here. If people did come this way, if the first Australians came across Sulawesi, they might have bumped into these people. We have stone tools here about 100,000 years ago. So we don't know what kinds of humans were making those stone tools because there are no human remains associated with them. But those people might have been hanging around when the first Australians came through. These people certainly were. These are hobbits in Indonesia. I'll get onto them in just a moment. Now, they were living there until about 50,000 years ago. And we know we have Australians here 65,000 years ago. So there's plenty of time to bump into a hobbit on your way across. Now, we've got no idea if they did or did not ever bump into a hobbit. Um, and that's something we're chasing down at the moment in this part of Indonesia. But it'd be fascinating if they did. I'll get on to hobbits in just a sec. But once we get to Australia, how do people actually get around it? Do we come in the north and sort of spread out radially? Or do we come in through Papua New Guinea and kind of go clockwise? Or maybe we came in through the Kimberley and went clockwise. Or maybe we came in up here and we do a pincer movement. We go both sides. We go down this coast and we go down this coast. All of these, I mean, there are more models than there are good data sets. That's what it comes down to at the moment. And that's why I say we know almost nothing about what really happened to this country until we can actually get some real data to bear on this question. So let's just briefly go back to Hobbits. This is another one, my little escapades. Here I was now 10 years later, 2001, with Mike Morwood, who also came to Wollongong. And Thomas Satikna, another one of our alumni who finished his PhD here just last year. That's me and Thomas in the hole here in Liang Bua. Liang Bua is where the Hobbit was found. In fact, the Hobbit was found just over here on this side of the cave, looking out of the cave, six metres under the ground. People had dug in that exact place before us, but they'd stopped two metres down. They could have got there 15 years before us. Um, as it was, we went down and again, everyone told us, we're wrong, it couldn't possibly be what we found it to be. So, I can sometimes feel like I'm the kind of forest gump of archaeology. I seem to end up in these sorts of ridiculous places for, for no apparent reason, not of my own design. Um, we're actually looking, when we went to this cave to begin with, we're actually looking for the very first Australians because we had those early sites in Australia, even based on my dates from Majibibi. But we didn't have anything like that as sites that old in Indonesia. So we went to Indonesia to go searching for early archaeological sites. And this was one of the sites we looked at. And of course, then we got waylaid by finding that hobbit um, down here in this hole in the ground. And very short, maybe only this height. And of course, for the next few years, we went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, and people were saying, it's not a different human species, it's actually a diseased version of us. And, um, and then we had various people join up, and uh, that's basically now dead in the water. Everyone's in paleoanthropology is pretty much content. It's a new species of human. It's called Homo floresiensis after Flores, the island. 
um, quite different. In, in many, its anatomical details are actually quite distinctly different from us. It's got a different shaped head, didn't say face. Its arms are much longer, its legs are much shorter. It's actually got anatomy that's quite distinctively not modern human. If you saw a modern human like that out there today, you'd notice them as being somewhat a bit strange. Um, and of course, you can't just pile on diseases onto a modern human and expect them to live. This was a fairly uh, uh, adult person, maybe 30 years old, something like that, adult male um, or female. We're not sure about the gender exactly because the pelvis isn't in really good condition. Um, but they were certainly an adult because all the cranial sutures had fused, all their teeth had erupted. Um, and you can't really live to being that age and have others. There are several individuals, maybe nine or ten individuals living in the cave if they're all diseased for over a long period of time. So it's a new human species, but actually what its relationship is to us, if we ever met them, we don't know. We're digging there every year, basically, to try and find more. Thomas is really leading this now as part of his fellowship here at the University of Wollongong and as part of what we're doing now as part of CARBA. And I'm still helping out in the best way I can. I've lost that shirt now, thank goodness. I've <laughs> seen quite a few photos from back then. I must have really loved it. So once we get to Australia, what happened next? Um, here, are some the, here are some of the ways we're trying to narrow it down. Um, these are, this is actually a model of Australia produced by Geoscience Australia on how much water availability there is now in Australia. The deeper the blue, the closer each of these areas is to water. So the darker blue is, of course, around the coastal fringe. And the whiter patches, which is least water, if you've, got, you've got to travel furthest to get to water, is in the middle. Um, and if you plant on top of that another map of how steep or, you know, are you going uphill or downhill, what you're really doing is you're doing things, two things. People, are, we're all dependent on water. We have to drink water frequently. So being close to water would be a good adaptive advantage if you're an early human trying to get around the country for the first time. And why, tr why climb up a hill if you can just go on flat land? So what's the, the least cost travel path you can take? Um, well, the least cost terrain really is either going along this coast or traveling this way and then coming up to the center afterwards. So this sort of pincer movement slightly is actually the most effective way to get yourself around Australia. That was done based uh, again by some of our chief investigators up at James Cook University. Another one done by some of our chief investigators in Adelaide is based on genetic data, that is looking at hair samples of Aboriginal people from the 1920s through to the 1960s, still modern data sets effectively, combining that with what we know about the archaeology and even some of this access to water information up here. That also, even on the genetic and archaeology, suggests there might have been a pincer movement around the country, that is people clung to the coasts pretty much and then got into central Australia much later. Bear in mind though, both of these two hypotheses are really, these two models are based on modern data sets. This is a modern water map for Australia, and this is basically modern indigenous people's genomes. What we need to work out is what was happening in the past. We don't know what the past water distribution was like, so let's start doing that. How can we do more on the ancient genomes is to actually get uh, DNA out of old bones and out of old human remains. So that's another thing we're trying to do as well. And the way we're going to do it is what we call informed exploration. We've got five areas up here, up here, down here, down here, and something in the middle. Just broadly, five areas spread around this area of Sahul and Malaysia. Some of the targets are really easy. They're kind of low-hanging fruit. We know these are going to be great sites to work on because people have dunked there before and they said, oh, this looks like really important stuff, but oh, I've run out of money or I've run out of time or I was using a really old technique. Somebody should do it with a much better technique now. So these are really easy ones to do and they're present in all of these areas and they're the ones we're starting off in years one and two. At the same time we're out there, we're doing these other ones, tier two sites. Now these are ones that we think have got really high potential based on reconnaissance surveys or looking at databases and you think, well, these ones should be really you know, hot targets to aim for. We don't know enough about them. So those are the ones we're ground truthing while we're out digging these sites. And tier three is the ones which, a bit like on the last slides, from remote sensing and modeling, where there should be some sites. No one's ever gone to explore there before. Let's say Eastern Pilbara. Why don't we do more there? There should be some really good sites there, but people really haven't looked there intensively. That's something we can do because we've got seven years in which to do it. So we do have a strategy about how we're going to look for sites. It's not just throwing potatoes in the field and hoping some of them are going to actually take seed. This is what we've done since June. Um, we only started on the 22nd of June. We've looked at new field sites, particularly in northern Australia. We've done reconnaissance surveys. We've done community consultations. It's important to get started on those early because it can take you maybe two, three years to get indigenous agreement to doing what it is we'd like to do and find out what they'd like us to do. So you've got to go back many, many times. You can't just rock up on a Wednesday and say, hi, can we start digging this weekend? 
no, you can't. It's a lot of paperwork that's got to be gone through. So the committee consultations start early. And we've already got some new research collaborations starting off. New, new Australian Research Council funding, which came through just a few weeks ago to do stuff up here in the Kimberley on rock art with the Kimberley Foundation Australia. So there are other ways in which we can get assistance to enlarge the scope of what we're doing. And we want to get out there that what we're doing is, you know, it's adventurous, it's fun. It's not all dry and dusty stuff. Um, sometimes STEM can be sold as if, you know, you've got to be a really a top-class nerd and a geek to really enjoy it. Actually, it's fun doing what we do as well. So here we are abseiling into a sinkhole. We had to go and collect a lake core. We had to get the boat in there somehow. So, um, you know, you tie yourself up the top, obviously, properly, and, uh, and then you get yourself into the sinkhole and collect your lake cores. And we do stuff in the middle of Lake Eyre and out on, you know, other lakes. These are archaeological digs, this one in Indonesia, these ones in Papua New Guinea in northern Australia. Um, there's a lot of outdoor stuff. And I think sometimes that gets lost when people talk about STEM. They think it's purely indoor stuff. It's all computation. There's no room for enjoyment or outdoors. Far from it. There's a whole lot of stuff out there in the real world we do. But if you're a geek, and I'm a bit of a geek as well, this is what I, my day job really is sort of uh, working in a lab, although I don't anymore now. I don't have enough time for that. But it's uh, one way of actually dating archaeological sediments. Uh, when was the last time they got exposed to sunlight? That's what we do with this particular method called luminescence dating. We bring them back into the lab and work out when it was buried in the ground. Then you can work out how old the fossil is or the artifact is buried in those sediments. So that's a way of dating sediments. But we also have, um, this is Rachel Wood at ANU. She does radiocarbon dating where you can date organic remains, things like wood, charcoal, shell. Uh, and she runs the lab there. We've also got a genetics lab we're, we're paired up with at the University of Adelaide and the Harvard and in Germany. And we've got a whole bunch of earth science type stuff spread around the country. So we have lots of kind of instrumental stuff. So if you don't like the outside and you're scared of spiders and snakes and whatever, um, you can hide away in the lab. That's fine. Um, there's, there's something for everyone, in other words. So you can be STEM or you can be doing something out there in the, in, in the broader world. So I'm just going to switch now from the research, which is all fun, and there's going to be a lot of great things we're going to find. But we've got to get it out there. It's no point just keeping to ourselves. It can't be just a good news story we're going to keep to ourselves. Um, and we're going to de develop and deliver this with all of our partners, the Australian Museum, Queensland Museum, South Australian Museum, State Library of New South Wales, and all our international museum and other partners. And it's important to get it out there for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. So what are we actually going to do? One of our key ones is to get the educational materials out for schools. We're working with indigenous schools up in uh, Torres Strait. That's the Tagai State College system that deals exclusively with an indigenous uh, school system. Um, that's through Martin Nakata at the, universe, at the James Cook University. He's from that region and he's worked with them for many years. In New South Wales, we're going to really work closely with the State Library of New South Wales. We've got a great outreach program throughout New South Wales. And in Queensland with the Queensland Museum, because they've got a fantastic outreach program in Queensland. So we pick people for particular reasons, so they can get to places we can't get to easily. And they know who it is we need to talk to in their education department. But of course, it's all very well doing things in the metropolitan centres, but we've actually got to do on-country activities with Indigenous uh, people as well. Because not all Indigenous people live in the cities. Indigenous people live on country. So we've got to get ourselves out there so that we can do something on-country for them in their own place. We have an artist in residence programme planned. We'll do the range of digital and traditional media, of course. We'll have exhibitions and major events. We'll have a travelling exhibition that does the major centres and some of the rural centres and travels overseas. And we're going to be doing things at the World Science Festival from next year, so come along to that. That's always held up in Brisbane. The Queensland Museum runs that each year, National Science Week. So we're going to get involved in all the traditional kind of sciencey things as well as non-sciencey things. So I don't want this, that's why I didn't call it science communication. It's much more than just science because a lot of people get turned off by science as being just too nerdy. So we want to avoid the idea that that's all we're going to be doing, science communication. But we are going to be doing science communication as well as other things. And from a research point of view, how much impact, can, can we actually evaluate whether we've had an impact? That's actually a research question in its own right. So Amanda Lawson and all the other people were very keen on our e, leading our E&E program, which is what Amanda's leading, to actually evaluate the impact we got, rather than just roll these things out and say, whew, haven't we done a lot? Uh, we can actually, and look how well we've done, or we could do better if we'd done it this way. So we can actually provide some guidelines for future people about how to roll out an E&E program. And again, we're going to be doing this face-to-face. -face. Here's in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Australia, and in the Metropolitan Centres. This is the World Science Festival. Uh, it's been going now for a couple of years up in Brisbane, held in March. It is coming up this, this in 2018. So again, we're going to be doing stuff in the town 
and in the country because we've got to get out there in as many ways as we can because not everyone, it's not a one-stop shop for every person. Um, and if you don't want to go anywhere, we're going to have our website up and running someday soon, very soon. Um, I was hoping it was already going to be up and running, but literally very, very soon. Um, and it's going to be under www.epicaustralia.org. Um, so that's an easy one to remember, Epic Australia. Uh, we've got a Facebook page, we've got a Twitter account and all of these sorts of things happening, as one has to. Um, Facebook's actually very important. It's possibly the most important one for us in the indigenous space because that's how most indigenous communities actually communicate via Facebook. They don't Twitter each other. They actually, Facebook really counts for a lot. So this is an important space for us to be occupying. And we're going to finish off with a couple of slides on that's the E&E, &E, but I also want to, we also want to get into the policy space. That is, how can we be useful for Australia going forwards? We're not saving lives, we're not making money in the usual way, so what are we doing for Australia beyond telling us what a wonderful story we've all had together in the past? Well, actually, we can do things to help safeguard our future. First thing is, we need to first of all establish those past patterns of environmental change. Then we can work out why they were actually happening. What were the processes driving those past changes? One of the things as part of that is to extend this drought atlas across Australia. This is something done by one of our chief investigators at UNSW, Chris Turney. He's done a, uh, this little heat map here, effectively, of how droughts have spread across eastern Australia in the last 500 or so years. We're now extending that across the whole of Australia. That'll give us at least a last few hundreds of years of ideas of what's been happening in this country. But we also want to extend back much further, back a few thousand years, so we can actually start to then test the performance of climate models. If we can say, well, that climate model really did predict what happened in the past very well and very accurately, we should be able to say, let's use it to the future and add on whatever humans are doing now into the mix and see what happens next. At the moment, we're kind of guessing a little bit about what might happen into the future because we haven't really been able to test it very well. It has lots of gaps about what happened in the past. And of course, everything we do is going to be open access. That's very important these days. You can't just collect all your data and hive it away for your own good purposes. It's been federally funded. It's got to be out there so other people can test it. And they can use their own models on it. And they might say, we're right or we're wrong. That doesn't matter. What matters is that other people have access to the same data set that the Australian government has funded. So it's all open access from here on. Of course, on the Indigenous heritage side, we're going to help document and celebrate our Indigenous heritage. That's the key thing. This is Indigenous history we're talking about. And we want to showcase all of this to the world in whatever ways we possibly can and get as many people to sort of, you know, make this kind of destination Australia. We get as many people to come here as we possibly can. And more broadly, future leaders, we want to contribute to the school curricula. And NISA is the National Innovation and Science Agenda. That's obviously one of the government's initiatives, but we want to be feeding into that because it's actually, you know, it's a good idea. Let's try and get Australia geared up for the future and not just be looking back into the past in terms of what we were doing as good in the past. That won't carry us for, forward very far. We need to change up what we're doing. We can start by making a culturally inclusive transdisciplinary mindset, as I mentioned at the start. Be broad. Don't get too narrow too quick. And inspire more women and indigenous Australians to stay in the Australian workforce, particularly in research. Because... Uh, by the time you get up to early and mid-career women researchers, the drop-off is alarming. And so we're missing out on like half the population of the country. Um, it's just, attrition is awful. It's got to be stemmed. And Indigenous Australians, we need to get them into the research workforce. It's a mainstream aspect of what we do, particularly in our area of Indigenous heritage and natural history. It's just like a, a mainstream, but it's just not, it's not in Indigenous cultural norms to be doing research. If they do, then Indigenous people tend to move towards health sciences or something they can bring back to their own people on country. But I think this area, natural history, their own cultural history, is something that really should appeal to indigenous people as well. So we have a lot of indigenous people as part of our center. And last of all, promote the excitement and adventure of exploration and discovery, whatever you're doing, what we call STEM by stealth. You know, trying to, trying to get people into STEM by the back door to say, this is STEM, you probably don't even realize it, but it genuinely is, you're doing real STEM and it's still fun to do it. So if you like any of what you've heard and you want to know more or you want to, you're keen to collaborate, please contact me, that's me there, um, or Julie Matasek, she's the Chief Operating Officer and the business cards are outside somewhere, or visit our CARPA website, which will be up very soon, www.epicaustralia.org. So thanks very much and uh, happy to take any questions. <laughs>